Yeah, so today I will talk about uh, uh, hydrodynamics and some of its uh, modern, say, applications. Um, so, um, yeah, of course, fluid phenomenon are really uh, ubiquitous in our life, in all aspects of our life. Um, yeah. And also, they're, say, uh, important what's inside the Earth, what's inside the Sun, and also for uh, our galaxy formations, exactly. And the hydrodynamics really has a very long history, dating back, say, uh, at least to uh, Archimedes and many, uh, and, uh, um, and many people uh, yeah, played a very important role in its development, like Newton, Euler, uh, Lavis, yeah, Lavia, Stokes, etc. And the basic idea of hydrodynamics is so-called the, <clears throat> <it's so -called> the <clears throat> the fluid approximation. So you really consider your matter, say, as a continuum uh, of fluid elements. So each of which uh, is considered to be macroscopic. Yeah, so, so each fluid uh, element in this formulation is a point, but the, but the single point is considered to be a macroscopic object, actually in local equivalent. And uh, as such, then you can assign such kind of thermodynamical quantities to each point in space-time, say the local density, local temperature, and also velocity flow, et cetera. So the, uh, this so-called the Euler uh, uh, a description of uh, uh, hydrodynamics. And then you express your conserved quantities, such as energy, momentum, et cetera, in terms of these uh, uh, more phenological macroscopic variables. And these are called constitute constitutive relations. And then you and then the equation motions of hydrodynamics, just the energy or momentum conservations. And if you have other conserved charges, then you also have continuity equations, etc. Okay. Yeah, so the formulation is very simple, but extremely powerful. And hydrodynamics also made some unexpected entries uh, in 21st century physics. So so here let me give you some example. Um, say first is the quark one plasma from heavy ion collisions. So as we know, at room temperature, quarks and gluons, they are always confined inside hydrons. But if we uh, raise the system to enough temperature, and then the hydrons will melt, and the quarks and gluons can be liberated, and they form so-called the quark one gluon, quark gluon plasma. And in, uh, in the lab, quark one plasma can be created by heavy ion collisions. So, so, so here is a simple cartoon. So for example, at LHC, you uh, collide, say, uh, NAD nuclei at very high, high energies. And when they collide, so in a very short time, say a large amount of energy, say this kinetic energy is released. Yeah, it's converted to the potential, to the, uh, to the internal energy to, to heat up the, uh, the hydrons. And then, uh, then quark one plasma can be formed. Okay, and uh, and after yeah, so after the collision, then then quark one plasma, yeah, they are not static, so so they expand. Uh, 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 then the things cool down, and eventually uh, uh, the uh, they will hydronize again. Okay. So so this uh, uh, quark one plasma created. Uh, uh, it's very tiny, say, say the size is essentially, uh, it's essentially roughly the size of a nuclear, uh, 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 yeah, nucleus. It's about, say, 10 to the four, uh, uh, minus 14 meter. And the lifetime is extremely short, very quickly hydron, very quickly it expands and hydronize. And the lifetime is about 10 to the minus 23 seconds, but the temperature is extremely high. Uh, it's about 10 to the 12 K. So, so in the lab, what do you observe? It's not directly the quark on plasma, but the thousands of particles you created during, uh, uh, after the quark on plasma has hydronized. Okay, so this is a typical uh, particle trajectories uh, you detected in your, yeah, uh, 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 you found in your detectors. Okay. So the experimental challenge is to, from, by looking at the behavior and the correlations, all these thousands of particles uh, recorded in your detectors, and they try to deduce the properties of this quark on plasma, which live for a very short time. Okay. 
And turns out that those correlations, uh, there was a very nice surprise. Turns out those correlations of detected particles, all these very large number of particles can be very well explained, okay? If you assume that the evolution of the quark-gram plasma after its creation actually follows hydrodynamics. And then you can just use the hydrodynamic evolution to, 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 to follow, say, the, uh, uh, the expansion and the, the hydronization of the uh, quark-gram plasma, and then you can explain this data very well. Okay. So this gives very strong evidence that the quark-gram plasma actually, after it's created, behaves like a fluid. And my second example is graphene. So graphene was, uh, uh, um, yeah, first uh, created in 2004, and uh, 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 in 2010, get the, 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 yeah, got the Nobel Prize. And graphene have many interesting properties. Say, uh, 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 for our purpose here, I just let me mention that uh, this is a very good conductor, and this can be made, uh, and it can be made very pure. So let me first remind you our typical uh, uh, picture of a conductor, say, uh, say of a metal, okay? So in the metal, the a typical picture which in your, uh, uh, say, college or high school physics is that there are various impurities and electrons move ballistically, say, inside the metal. And occasionally they collide, say, with those impurities and that consists, and then that contribute to the uh, uh, resistivity exactly. But, but in the graphene, uh, electrons actually behave very differently. As I mentioned, that graphene can be made very pure. And so we can uh, actually uh, assume that impurities don't actually exist in graphene. Okay. So it turns out uh, the, uh, uh, the electrons in graphene, they, they more or less move, they don't move ballistically, they, more, uh, they move like a fluid. Okay, so if you say, if you have a barrier, so they can go around the barrier rather than heat the barrier, okay? Uh, 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 they can actually flow rather than just uh, 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 move ballistically. So here is a very simple uh, uh, thought experiment to, to, to probe whether the uh, electrons, say in the graphene behaves, say like a fluid or ballistically or, or, or like particles, okay? So, so, so imagine you have a slab of graphene, okay? So, uh, uh, so in this, say occupy this plane. And uh, 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 now you imagine you put the, yeah, put uh, uh, some, some uh, uh, potential differences between the upper edge and the lower edge, okay? And then, then under this uh, a potential difference, then the, the electron will flow. And if the electrons say move ballistically in the graphene, then, then, that, then that's what you should see. And then we just see that the, uh, 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 yeah, electrons move from, yeah, yeah, just normally from the, um, yeah, from the source to the drain uh, uh, under these potential differences. But if electrons behave like fluid and fluid have viscosity, et cetera, and then you can create this kind of a backflow, okay? And for the backflow from the point of view, if you measure the resistance, say the potential, uh, divide, uh, the potential difference divided by the current, and then the naivety you would see actually the lactive uh, 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 resistivity because you can have the current flow in the opposite direction of the potential. Okay. Yeah, so this is a very simple way that you see the difference between the fluid and the ballistic transport. Okay. And indeed that's what people see uh, 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 in the, uh, in, yeah, at almost the same time, uh, uh, such experiment actually was uh, performed in the, uh, uh, in the GAMS group at Manchester and indeed, they uh, uh, observe this negative uh, local resistance. Again, which give you the strong uh, indication that electrons actually um, flows like a fluid. And the, uh, uh, my third example uh, uh, is actually uh, called uh, uh, Fermi gases. Say, uh, 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 so uh, for example, this is, uh, um, say, uh, this is a collection of lithium six atoms. And then that you can find them in the cigar shape of potential, and then they, they can find in this kind of element shape. Okay. And now imagine, so uh, so the color uh, means the density of the um, yeah of the atoms. So uh, so this bright ye yellow region means the high density region. 
and the temperature is extremely low, it uh, tends to the minus 9k. And now imagine you just release the potential, okay? Uh, uh, I'd say at time equal to zero, you, you, you remove the potential. And there's no confining potential than this, than the atoms in this uh, element shape will just expand. And if they expand ballistically and very quickly, you should see that this element shape, uh, yeah, it, if they just randomly uh, uh, expanding all directions, and then this will quickly become a spherical shape. But if the, the atoms actually behave as a fluid, means they behave like a clack, uh, if they move collectively, and then, then they move under the pressure difference. And under this airman shape, and the, uh, the horizontal pressure is higher because, the, um, yeah, because it's, a, it's a, a, a shorter distance and then the longitudinal direction, yeah, because the longitudinal extension is much, much larger. And then, and then this element shape uh, uh, thing will uh, expand faster okay, in the, uh, along the horizontal direction and it behaves like fluid. Indeed, that's what you observe. And you find that the, uh, 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 yeah, uh, when you release the, uh, 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 the potential and actually expand faster uh, along the horizontal uh, direction. Again, strongly in the, uh, 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 yeah, give rise to this collective flow and uh, 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 governed by hydrodynamics. Again, this can be simulated uh, uh, by hydrodynamics. So, so to summarize, so we discussed three, say, exotic uh, quantum matter, yeah, exotic quantum matter, and the, the hydrodynamics have been very effective, say, in describing them. And so the quagon plasma, graphene, and this cold atomic gases. And these three different matters, they, they are very, very different. Okay, they cannot be more different. So say, for example, for quagon plasma, they're governed by strong interactions and at very high temperature, 10 to the 12K. And the graphene is essentially uh, governed by electromagnetic interactions and which is at room temperature. And this uh, uh, cold atomic gases just uh, um, they're governed by short range atomic interactions, say uh, uh, at unitary limit, and uh, it's very, very cold, say 10 to a minus 9K. Okay. But somehow uh, uh, the hydrodynamics apply to all of them uh, uh, equally well. Okay. So in fact, actually there's a very simple reason behind it. Uh, uh, so, so let's just consider, uh, uh, say, yeah, just consider a general a quantum many body system, say in thermal equivalent. And now let's consider some long wavelength disturbance of such a system. Okay. And the evolution of such a disturbance depends on very much actually on whether this uh, disturbance is on the conserved quantity or, or, or long conserved quantity. And this, yeah, uh, yeah, also let me just emphasize by long wavelengths, I mean that the wavelength is much, much larger than the mean free pass. Okay, so, so here I give you a, 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 a heuristically a long wavelength disturbance. And you should imagine, say, horizontal direction as some spatial direction, and the vertical direction, say, as the density of some, some observables. Uh, yeah, just, just some quantity of some observables. And then this wavelength is much larger than the local mean free pass. And if this uh, uh, disturbance is in the long conserved quantity, and then such a quantity, uh, then such a disturbance can uh, relax locally. Okay, so at every point in space, and they can just relax uh, independently of each other. Okay, so the typical uh, relaxation time would be like a mean free, uh, uh, a mean free time. Okay, it's very short. Yeah, so uh, 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 they can just relax locally. But if the uh, disturbed quantity is actually conserved quantities. And then conserved quantity below cannot be destroyed locally. They can only be transported, okay? And then that means that the, uh, this disturbance can only be relaxed if local deficit somehow is compensated by, uh, by this local access, okay? So then you need to uh, uh, transport this local access to the local deficit. And that requires time uh, uh, because of causality, okay. And uh, it, in particular, if the wave time, uh, if the wavelength goes infinity, then that means relaxation time goes infinity. 
So conserved quantities actually relax very, uh, very slowly at long wavelengths, okay, because they cannot uh, be disjoint. So, so if we are interested only in physics at very large distance scales, say so very large distance scale, yeah, uh, a large distance scales compared to mean free pass and the long time compared to the uh, uh, mean free time. And then, then all the local non-conserved quantities, yeah, all non-conserved quantities will very quickly achieve local equilibrium. And only dynamics of conserved quantities are relevant. And uh, so, so yeah, all other details are just washed out by interactions. And so this is the reason that hydrodynamic is so powerful because hydrodynamic is precisely uh, the theory of conserved quantities. Okay. And uh, so, uh, so the key is that the, uh, uh, the distance and time scale, uh, distance and time scales you probe must be not much larger than your typical mean free uh, pass and the mean free time. Okay. So now let's go back to these three uh, examples. So now it's not surprising that hydrodynamics can apply to them. Okay, uh, 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 because if we observe these three systems at large distance and time scales, and then we indeed we should uh, 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 see uh, evolution of a uh, 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 hydrodynamics. But there's an important catch here: is that we actually observe those systems at not very, not at say uh, 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 of conventional macroscopic scales. So as I mentioned, the quagon plasma are extremely short-lived and, uh, uh, and the tiny, okay, uh, uh, it's a very tiny droplet. So in order for, uh, uh, in order for hydrodynamics to apply, then that means that the mean free pass uh, and the free, mean free time for the QCD at this kind of temperature scale must still be much, much not, uh, must be smaller say than the 10 to the minus 14 uh, uh, sides and 10 to the minus 23 seconds of the quagon plasma, uh, say, lifetime. And this, uh, uh, similarly for this graphene, so the graphene you created in the lab is actually uh, pretty tiny. And again, that somehow the mean free part for the electron must be much smaller than the size you probe it. And similarly, say, say for these cold atom gases. And so that means that the, uh, the mean free parts have really be, so if you turn it around, that the fact that the hydrodynamics actually Applied to those materials implies that the mean free pass have to be really sufficiently short. Okay, and then you can just deduce that all these three systems at the scale which we observe them, they must be strongly intact. Okay, so uh, so so in particular at the temperature scale which this quagon plasma created by say by by RIC or by LHC, they they must be still uh, uh, strongly intact. Yeah, the same is the other two. So the fact that hydrodynamics actually apply to those systems can actually be used as a very powerful uh, uh, a clue to, to study, say, uh, interactions of those systems, say, interaction strengths of those systems. So, so yeah, yeah, it's just from this general discussion and the fact that the, uh, uh, and those examples, so we see that the hydrodynamics can be actually be viewed really as a universal theory for long equilibrium dynamics, say of general quantum many body system, okay, at sufficiently long distances and times, okay. And the traditional formulation of hydrodynamics, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, uh, corresponding to you just write down your uh, conservation equations and then with phenological uh, constitutive relations. Okay. But as the universal, say, uh, as, uh, no energy theory, for, for general quantum many body systems, then we should actually be able to really derive hydrodynamics or formulate hydrodynamics, say as a proper effective field theory, say from first principle. Okay. And uh, so this is not uh, uh, just a, a purely academic question because the uh, a traditional formulation of hydrodynamics, which is as an equation motion cannot really capture uh, fluctuations. So as we know, say, if you write down the equation motion, you just evolve it. Uh, you cannot really uh, study the fluctuations. And uh, so uh, uh, there are some phenomenological uh, fixes to, to take into account of, uh, of fluctuations so by, for example, by including some uh, uh, stochastic terms in your equation motion. But, but those phenomenological fixes cannot really uh, apply to far from equipment situations. 
But there are many uh, physical contexts, say fluctuations, both statistical, say all quantum, if, uh, uh, quantum fluctuations are important. Okay. And so, uh, 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 so uh, uh, to formulate uh, hydrodynamics as a genuine, say, effective field theory from first principle, then you should be able to take into account those fluctuations. So now let me just give you two examples uh, of which, uh, uh, say, uh, fluctuate, uh, hydrodynamic fluctuations actually are very important. So why is a very old problem? Uh, so this is more than 100 years old, this so-called Rayleigh Ballard problem, uh, which is the uh, example of this so-called non-equivalent phase transition. So, uh, so this is something we actually see every day. So imagine you have, uh, say, a tank of water, and then you heat this water uh, uniformly, say, uh, uh, say, at the bottom of the tank. Say, and normally, as you heat, say, uh, um, your water in your pot, and then, and then the, yeah, and then the water in the bottom is directly uh, uh, heated and it's hot, and then the and the water in the top uh, in the top is cold. It's a room temperature uh, at the beginning. And so, if the temperature difference, uh, if the temperature uh, uh, difference between the top and bottom is small, and then your uh, your your steady state is essentially you have a temperature gradient, say from the bottom to the top, okay. and there's no macroscopic motion uh, in the uh, uh, say in your tank. But we know that if the temperature gradient is big enough, and then uh, convection will start, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, there will be convections. And then the water will uh, flow, uh, there will be microscopic flow uh, uh, in your tank. And then the transition between the two uh, uh, are driven by hydrodynamic fluctuations. Okay. So this is so, so called non equivalent, yeah, so this is an example of non equivalent phase transition. And also a lot of modern example uh, is the search for the QCD critical point. So this is a phase diagram for QCD. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of things in this phase diagram. So uh, I will not go into uh, detail of it. Uh, uh, just to mention that the vertical uh, axis is the temperature and the horizontal axis is the, uh, 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 the baryon chemical potential. Okay, essentially the baryon density. And so at a very small baryon density, say suppose, uh, suppose the quagrum plasma is neutral, and then the, the transition between the hydronic, uh, yeah, the system is neutral, then the transition between the hydronic gas and the quagrum plasma is a smooth crossover. But then at some finite density, then eventually become first order phase transition. Yeah, uh, there's still theoretical uh, uh, support for it. And then if this is the phase diagram, then there must be a critical point somewhere. Okay. And uh, so, so, so actually experiment, so experiment, so experiments actually are right, right now are going on at the Brookhaven lab to actually uh, uh, try to probe this critical point uh, using high VM conditions. So what distinguishes this critical point, say, say from other regions in your phase diagram, so is that, uh, yeah, at a critical point, you have enhanced fluctuations. And so by study, uh, uh, say, your observables near this critical, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, say, if you, in your, uh, say, if you see strong indications in the product that we have air collisions and uh, 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 of large fluctuations, then that's a strong indication of the critical point. So as I mentioned, this uh, uh, high air collisions are simulated by hydrodynamic uh, evolutions. And then such fluctuations then, of course, are very important. And when you do your hydrodynamic simulations, so yeah, so this is a lot of example that hydrodynamic fluctuations actually play a very important role. Yeah, uh, here actually plays the key essential role. Okay, yeah, yeah so this is distinguished by large fluctuations. And so uh, say a formulation of hydrodynamics based on first principle of uh, effective field theory, and then should this to action principle and then incorporates a systematically fluctuation, uh, fluctuation. So, so, so let me mention that search for action principle of, uh, for dissipative hydrodynamics actually has been a long-standing problem, say, dating back at least to the ideal fluid action of Hercules uh, around uh, 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 1911. And then the last decade, due to various uh, 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 interest in cosmology, say string theory or particle physics, et cetera, uh, yeah, have a uh, quagrum plasma, and then uh, uh, nuclear physics, and then there, ha uh, there have been many activities and try to uh, understand 
say the, uh, some kind of effective field theory between or action principle uh, of hydrodynamics. So here uh, uh, I will talk about the formulation which we developed say a, couple, uh, a, a few years ago say with my former student Paulo Corrielso and Mike Crossley and also with uh, uh, later with Pingao. And we are able to formulate say, yeah, reformulate the theory and the based on just symmetries and action principles say, of effective field theory. So, uh, and we, yeah, I uh, use techniques and the insight from quantum field series, gravity, and also string theory. So let me just, uh, uh, first of all, just remind you the basic uh, 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 formulation of effective field theory. So let's just imagine you have a, a full path integral of some quantum many body system. So what we do, yeah, of course, we can never actually perform such a path integral unless uh, uh, it's in some very special uh, uh, situations, say either it's a free theory or some, some integrable theory. And so uh, say what we do is we identify, say important, the relevant low energy degrees freedom. And then we just imagine you can integrate out the rest. Okay, those are not, uh, 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 those uh, 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 other degrees freedom are not important at, uh, at the low energies. And then you get this path integral just for this low energy degrees freedom. Now, of course, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, and this is a low energy effective action for your low energy degrees freedom. Of course, the direct computation of this uh, effective action is not possible. Okay. If you really could perform this path integral, then you already have solved the issue. And so the idea of effective field theory is that we just identify symmetries and the constraints should be satisfied by this effective action. And then we just write down the most general theory are consistent with the symmetries and the constraint. And, uh, and then we would like to formulate hydrodynamics this way. Okay, we identify the symmetry and the constraints, and then we just write down the most general theory. And so here the challenges are, uh, 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 for this particular case are the following. So first, the hydrodynamics is a dissipative theory. And so there's some standard law that dissipative systems actually don't have an action formulation. Okay, so this is the familiar example, say if you have a friction and uh, your yeah, high school example, when you have a friction and we, yeah, we don't know how to form, yeah, uh, there's no action uh, uh, principle uh, um, for such a kind of system. And another uh, uh, difficulty is the dynamic variables. What are the low energy variable you should use for, uh, for your dynamics? It turns out actually these standard phenological variables, even though they are very convenient, say for writing down phenological equations, they're actually not very suitable uh, uh, for action principle formulation. For example, the temperature uh, uh, is not, say, um, yeah, it, it's a, a microscopic variable which have no uh, um, good yeah, way to formulate, say, uh, uh, if you really want to write down effective field theory. So, so the uh, the analog, yeah. Let me just give you a uh, analog situation. This is a little bit like electromagnetism. So if you try to formulate uh, the action using the electric field and magnetic field, and we know it's very difficult to do. It's easy to formulate equation motion using electric and magnetic field, but it's very uh, but you cannot really formulate the action uh, using electric magnetic field. So here is a little bit similar. So you should view those standard hydrodynamic variable really as derived quantities, say for something more uh, 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 fundamental formulation. Okay. And then, then at last is that what symmetries then should, we, uh, should be imposed for hydrodynamics, okay, to formulate hydrodynamics. Uh, for example, what symmetries should define a fluid? Okay. So there are also some other uh, 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 symmetries we should consider as I uh, will mention later. Okay. So, so uh, yeah, so that's what we are, are going to proceed. Uh, I will describe how we address these three uh, uh, difficult issues. Yes, three, uh, uh, these three different issues. So before I do that, do you have any questions? Okay, good. So, so let me just tell you how to uh, uh, address each of those questions. So, so first, let's talk about uh, 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 dissipations. So, so this the issue is actually turns out that the dissipation is naturally resolved by quantum mechanics. 
So even though, so it turns out here, in order to understand how to address the dissipation, of course, dissipation is, a, a, in the sense you say, it's a classical phenomenon, okay? And we can formulate it classically, et cetera. But it turns out the way to, uh, to formulate uh, uh, action principle with dissipation is actually to start with quantum mechanics. And then you can go to the classical limit. Okay, and turns out the quantum mechanics provide the natural way to proceed. And so now let's consider, say, a quantum system. We are interested in the dynamics of a non-equilibrium state, okay, which is say uh, away from equilibrium. And then the standard formulation, say, if you have a, a density operator, say, a rho zero, which is away from equilibrium. And then the standard formulation is that you consider the path integral, uh, uh, evolution of u and u dagger, okay and uh, 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 for the evolution of this density operator. And each u, uh, you can represent it by part in the row. And since you have u and u dagger, and then this evolution can be represented by two paths in the rows. Okay, so, what, so one going forward in time and one going backward in time. And then if you consider the observables, say in this uh, line equivalent state, and then you take the trace, and then when you take the trace, you essentially you can close then you essentially identify one end of this path in the goal, uh, uh, between these two paths. Okay. And then you get uh, a, a counter so-called the uh, close time path or stringer Kadish counter, which essentially you go from minus infinity to plus infinity, and then you go back to minus infinity. Okay. And so, so you have two counter, uh, two uh, time a counter which joined at the t equals infinity. And then the simplest observables uh, along equipment observables can be formulated by part integrals on this uh, so-called closed time curve, yeah, closed time path. And then now the key, say now if we want to de develop effective field theory to describe some uh, dynamics of a long equivalent state, and then we actually need to uh, develop effective field theory on this closed time path, rather than on the standard effective field theory which you do, say for transition amplitude, and then you just uh, 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 for on the single time pass, okay, just for minus two pass infinity. But here we need to develop effective field theory uh, for systems on the closed time pass. Okay. And it, uh, uh, so the simple example of this is just Brownian motion. Okay, Brownian motion is a particle, uh, is a heavy particle moving uh, 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 in some kind of state. Okay. And it turns out uh, 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 this closed time pass uh, uh, automatically take into account the uh, uh, the fluctuate uh, uh, the uh, the dissipative and the retardation effect, okay, and so uh, you don't need to do anything, okay. Just if you formulate the effective field theory on this closed time pass, then the dissipation is automatically incorporated. So uh, so for example, in this Brownian uh, brown motion example, and if you just follow this the uh, uh, the motion of this uh, heavy particle in this closed time pass. And then in quantum mechanics, and then take the classical limit, you find that you get the classical action on this closed time pass. Yeah, you get a classical, uh, a classical uh, uh, action, which the, uh, um, uh, which the dissipation automatically incorporated. Okay. So the key thing here is actually, uh, yeah, uh, 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 then you get the action principle for this uh, Langevin equation developed with the um, uh, Brownian motion. And uh, so, uh, so the key thing here, yeah, let me just mention one thing. The key thing here is actually you need to double your degrees freedom because now you have two paths, okay? Uh, one going to uh, from minus infinity to plus infinity and one go, uh, uh, go from the plus infinity to minus infinity. So the key thing uh, uh, to actually uh, 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 to take into account those uh, dissipative effect is actually you need to double your degrees freedom. And now we can try to apply this uh, to hydrodynamics uh, to, to a general kind of many body systems. And they try to understand how to formulate a theory uh, 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 for say, for general kind of many body uh, system. Okay. And then you can just put your kind of many body system on such a close time pass, okay? And then our uh, 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 next task would be just to identify the dynamic variable. In other words, we want to, add, as I mentioned, the hydrodynam uh, hydrodynamics just corresponding to essentially the, uh, uh, it's the effective theory for conserved quantities. So the question is, how do we identify the universal variables 
say, uh, associate with the energy momentum conservations, okay, uh, with such kind of conserved quantities. So here you are in some kind of, like, if you are in some kind of uh, 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 situation, which say, because once you talk about energy conservation, energy momentum conservation, you're already in some kind of equation, uh, equation motion, okay? Because when you write down uh, the energy uh, conservation equation, uh, you are just write down the equation, okay? Uh, 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 you don't have some kind of action for it, okay? So the question somehow is, to identify uh, 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 the, uh, the universal variable somehow associated with the energy conservation. And that in turn will provide a way somehow you can, uh, uh, you can have an action, uh, a principle formulation. So here we can have a mathematical, uh, yeah, here we can use a, a, a mathematical trick. You said, even though we are interested in the system say in flat space time, but if we can imagine put the system in the curved space time. Okay, as we know from general relativity or just from a quantum field theory in the curved space time. And because of the energy conservation, and then we put a quantum field theory on the curved space time, say the resulting system, say for example, the partition function should be different morphism invariant. Okay, uh, the free energy or, or any uh, uh, or quantity you compute in your path integral should be different morphism invariant. And now you can just use the different morphism invariants as the uh, 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 yeah, as a proxy for energy momentum conservation. Okay, so now we have reformulated the energy momentum conservation uh, in terms of some kind of symmetry principle. Okay, uh, 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 somehow your theory have to be from morphism invariant, and they say uh, uh, invariant under any coordinate transformation. So now, then there's a very simple uh, uh, trick. To, uh, 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 to write down uh, uh, yeah, the dynamical variable to incorporate that. So essentially you can use just the so-called the Stokeberg uh, trick. And you can just promote your space-time coordinates into dynamical variables. And then when you integrate over all possible uh, choice of your coordinate transformations, then of course this, uh, uh, the series is automatically a different morphism variant, okay? So, so essentially, you just promote your uh, space-time coordinate into dynamical variables, and then you integrate over it. Okay? And then it's e equivalent, you integrate over all possible uh, uh, coordinate transformations. And so uh, then you can show that indeed that the equations uh, uh, of this x mu, uh, which is a dynamical uh, 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 coordinate transformation, actually are equivalent to energy momentum conservation. And uh, here, uh, uh, there's a new catch. Is that now you you promote your uh, 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 coordinate into a dynamical variable, you integrate over all possible coordinate transformation, but still you have to introduce a reference space time. Okay, you have to introduce a new auxiliary space time as a reference space time, so that you can talk about all possible coordinate transformations. Okay, so now we actually need to introduce a new auxiliary space time, say with coordinate which are labeled the sigma a. So this new space time, of course, have the same space time dimension as our original space time, and, uh, uh, and now just this x mu become all possible coordinate transformations. Okay, so now the dynamic variables, I just now you have two copies of them. As I mentioned on this closed time pass, you need to double your degree freedom. So now we just have two copies of this all possible coordinate transformations uh, as a function of your this reference space time. And so, so naively, this seems very unintuitive, okay? Uh, uh, what's the interpretation of this reference space time? And what's the physical interpretation of this uh, uh, coordinate transformation? So it turns out that there's actually a very simple physical uh, uh, interpretation of it. It turns out this is just a generalization of the standard Lagrange description of a fluid. So let me just remind you what's the Lagrange description of a fluid. So as I mentioned that in the, uh, in this, yeah, let's imagine just you here, you have a fluid flow. So as I mentioned uh, 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 previous, uh, 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 at the beginning, you have this Euler description. So you can see the space time point, and then you can see the say velocity uh, field, the temperature field, and the density field at that point, and then you study that, uh, uh, the dynamics. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, how those quantities evolve with the space time. And this alternative formulation is called the Lagrange formulation. It's also sometimes called the core moving formulation. 
is that you put a label, okay, for each fluid element. So this label each fluid element by uh, by sigma i, okay, because the fluid elements uh, they they fill the uh, full space, and then the sigma i have the same dimension as the uh, space, and then uh, and then uh, so each fluid element now has a, a label sigma i, and now you can just follow how that fluid element move in space time, okay, and then uh, 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 then you and then this x i corresponding to the coordinate of this fluid uh, element uh, in space time. And then, then this I, uh, X i, T sigma i, then just describe the motion of this fluid element uh, in space time. Okay, uh, uh, you just follow uh, uh, its motion in space. Okay. And uh, so, so now we can just come back to think about this uh, uh, our variable. And now you can just label, uh, imagine this sigma i again, uh, label the individual fluid element. Okay, now sigma zero, and now just na a natural generation can just consider uh, to be some kind of internal, uh, 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 rather than using the, uh, your physical time. Uh, you can imagine for each fluid element, you can associate internal time. And now then, then this mapping then just corresponding to the motion of the, uh, this fluid element in your space time. Okay, uh, as a function of each fluid element and its internal time. Uh, okay, just imagine, so here the picture is, imagine you have a fluid space time with each spatial uh, uh, section corresponding to uh, uh, labeling a uh, uh, fluid element. And then it, 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 in this fluid time, each fluid element have its, uh, 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 its say internal time. And now this mapping just map to this uh, 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 traject, uh, uh, this say this, yeah, this, Say this fluid element in your fluid space time to your space time trajectory. Okay. And so this, uh, uh, you have two copies of your face time because you have uh, uh, this closed time pass. And then, and then this function essentially just describes the motion, say, of your fluid element in these two copies of your space time. So we see the, the somehow this fancy diffeomorphism invariance consideration actually essentially just recovered. Uh, this uh, 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 Lagrange description of fluid, which actually uh, uh, is more than 300 years old. Okay. Good. And so uh, uh, having uh, uh, treated what should be the dynamical degrees freedom, and now we can just try to identify the symmetries. Okay. And the symmetry is divided into three types. So, so the first symmetry is how do we Formulate the fluid. Okay, what kind of symmetries say identify a, a, a fluid rather than say a solid or liquid crystal or some other kind of continu uh, a continuous media? Okay, so turns out that there's a very simple formulation. If you uh, keep in mind this formulation of this sigma i as label individual fluid elements and this sigma zero as internal time for each fluid element, and then then of course the uh, you should be able to yeah, this just some kind of arbitrary label. Okay, you should be able to relabel your fluid elements. Okay, and uh, of course you can only do this relabeling at in, at a given time. So once you have relabeled, yeah, once you have labeled your fluid element, you can no longer change it. Okay, uh, later. Okay, so that means the uh, the fluid element uh, uh, the action should be invariant under. Uh, uh, a time independent relabeling of the fluid element. Okay, so if you make an arbitrary uh, transformation uh, in this fluid element itself, uh, uh, the action should be invariant. Okay, your physics should not depend on how you relate, you label your uh, 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 fluid elements. And also, if you follow the trajectory of each fluid element, the phys uh, physics should not depend on uh, uh, how you parameterize that internal time. Okay, so if you follow each fluid element, say uh, if you keep sigma i, and then your uh, internal time, yeah, it does not should not depend on how you formulate your internal time. Okay, and it turns out that these two symmetries defines what is a fluid. Okay, and uh, it turns out these symmetries are indeed uh, do magic for you. Okay, they're very powerful, and uh, and then uh, then they recover the standard formulation of hydrodynamics, the modulo some phenomenological constraints. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, that the standard formulation of hydrodynamics is you write down your constitutive relation in terms of velocity, 
say temperature and the density, those kind of microscopic variables, and then just impose energy conservation. And turns out that this uh, formulation uh, just recovers that. So modulo some, yeah, uh, as I mentioned, modulo some modulo constraint, which I'm going to mention. So, so essentially you can just, so essentially now we have, essentially have a GR problem, okay? You just write down a series which have different morphism for this X mu, but then have a lot of form, uh, 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 some kind of special different morphism for this XI and X zero. And then you can just write down, uh, formulate this as some kind of GR uh, a problem. And as a, a, a problem in differential geometry, okay? And I write down the curvature exactly, it turns out they just precisely recover uh, 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 your, yeah, it, it, it turns out, yeah, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, yeah, once you properly transform, uh, translate them into the uh, fluid language, and then they just re, uh, uh, recover your uh, 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 standard, say, velocity uh, temperature kind of formulation. So this would be the full story if it's in the usual formulation. But here we actually have some other uh, non trivial constraint we need to impose. So one constraint uh, is from unitary time evolution. So when you formulate your theory on this closed time pass contour, and actually there's a non trivial uh, 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 constraint that this effective action should satisfy uh, uh, for, for any theory, for any quantum theory uh, formulated on such a contour. So we're not going to detail here. Okay, uh, 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 let me just write down the answer. Yeah, so this chi one, chi two corresponding to your, uh, your dynamic variables say associated with each part of the contour. You have two contours or chi one is for the first part, chi two is for the second part. Anyway, uh, so there, there's some kind of uh, unitarity constraint you need to impose uh, on your effective action. So what's interesting is that when you write down your quantum effective action, okay, and then you can take a classical limit. So when you take the classical limit, and then you get a, a, a statistical field theory, okay? Because you still have statistical fluctuations, uh, even though when you have to take H bar goes to zero, uh, uh, this is a, a, a many body system. So, so even when you take the uh, classical limit, you still have uh, uh, statistical fluctuations. And you find actually uh, under this effective action becomes the uh, 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 effective action for that statistical field theory. And then the remarkable thing is that you find that those constraints actually survive in the classical limits. Okay, they become the constraints which should be satisfied by the uh, by this statistical uh, 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 field theory. Okay, uh, governing your uh, many body system. And uh, then the then the last condition is the most uh, 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 unintuitive one. This is the so-called local equivalent. So, so a key element of formula, uh, formulation of hydrodynamics is so-called the local equivalent because you assume all these non-conserved quantity uh, uh, that have uh, 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 equilibrated locally. Okay, so you have local equivalent. And uh, so, so in traditional formulation of hydrodynamics, this local equivalent is actually imposed uh, phenomenologically by hand. For example, you need to impose by hand the first and second law of thermodynamics. Okay, so you require uh, you had your dynamics to actually satisfy the first and second law of uh, uh, some dynamics by hand. And so that puts some constraints uh, uh, on your equation motion. Okay. And the second thing is also leads to impose by hand the so-called ensemble relation from the underlying time reversal. So, so say for a typical many body system at the microscopic formulation uh, uh, quantum mechanics is uh, 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 a time reversal invariant. Okay, uh, uh, dissipation they come from as a microscopic phenomenon. So under uh, uh, there's still time reversal at the microscopic level. Uh, and so uh, 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 so this microscopic time reversal give rise to these so-called uh, uh, ensemble relations, which should be uh, satisfied again uh, uh, for your observables. And then in the traditional formulation. Uh, then you, again, you have uh, uh, you have to impose this ensemble relation by hand. Somehow you have to by hand constrain your equation motion uh, so that they satisfy this ensemble relation. Okay, but it turns out you don't have to do this uh, by hand. You need, uh, of course, in the effective field theory, we cannot do this by hand. Uh, uh, you should just formulate the symmetry. It turns out uh, uh, a little bit unintuitively. This kind of local equilibrium uh, condition can be formulated by imposing a Z2 symmetry, which we call a dynamical KMS symmetry, which I will not uh, uh, write down here explicitly. Okay. 
And so let me just explain uh, 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 what this comes about. Okay, so this dynamical below that for, uh, for physical observables at the thermal equilibrium, and they the so called uh, uh, satisfy this uh, so called KMS relation. So the key point is that we want to generalize this KMS relation to this local equilibrium situation, okay, uh, uh, which system is still non equilibrium, but, uh, but, uh, uh, but to some kind of local equilibrium situation. It turns out that can be achieved by some kind of D2 symmetry. Okay, and so it turns out this D2 symmetry does the uh, match for you actually uh, not only. Uh, automatically impose this ensemble relation, actually generalize the standard uh, linear ensemble relation to the nonlinear level, and also uh, uh, is, uh, equivalently impose some kind of local uh, fluctuation dissipation relation. Okay, uh, 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 this no, uh, uh, which guarantees your local equilibrium. So just to summarize, so the symmetries uh, uh, are three types. So the symmetry is defining a fluid then constraint from the quantum unitarity, which survive in the classical limit, and then the D2 symmetry, okay, uh, which impose this local equilibrium and the, the uh, a time reversal, uh, a microscopic time reversal. And, uh, and when you combine them together, and then, uh, uh, then you get a statistical field theory, uh, uh, say if you take the classical limit, and which fully re uh, recover the standard hydrodynamics equation motion, uh, uh, but actually also uh, uh, you have a hacking principle formulation. Okay. And uh, uh, also you derive those phenological constraints rather than uh, impose them by hand. Okay, so let me just mention some immediate implications of this formulation. So one surprising formulation, uh, 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 one surprising uh, application is that actually entropy uh, arises emergently uh, in this formulation as a loss of charge. So it turns out Say the, the combination of this unitary constraint, a uh, unitarity constraint, and this dynamical KMS symmetry leads to a remarkable consequence. Okay, uh, you said you can show that this theory you can construct a local current, which I call S mu, and the charge associated with this local current never decreases. Okay, so, uh, so if you look at the, uh, the charge of this uh, uh, local current, the zeros component in integrated over the spatial direction. And then you find actually the uh, 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 this thing never decreases, okay? And so that's give you a new derivation of the second law of some dynamics. So here the entropy is actually purely uh, emergent. So here we just find that the existence of local current, and then you just find the charge of this local current. It turns out the charge of this local current, if you apply to the equivalent situation, and then that coincides to the standard uh, 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 the entropy, uh, uh, say uh, for equivalent situation. But in the long equivalent situations, then this gives rise uh, uh, to this uh, uh, second law of thermodynamics. Okay. So not only this shows that this entropy cannot decrease, but actually you can derive this entropy production explicitly, okay, uh, 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 in terms of the thermodynamical quantities. And so this gives you a universal expression for the entropy production. Okay, uh, um, yeah. And uh, Okay. Yeah. Also, let me just by passing this uh, C, we also have an emergent supersymmetry, and uh, and that even though the action we write down is actually purely bosonic, but you can show that this this action is actually very special. You said this action is such that it can always be supersymmetrized. Okay. If you add some suitable uh, 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 fermionic variable, and then you find that the action can always be supersymmetrized. This is not the case if you just write down some uh, a, a random action, okay? And so, uh, so somehow this uh, uh, action have some kind of emerging hidden supersymmetry. And again, uh, uh, this can be understood as the consequence of unitarity and this dynamical, uh, this D2 symmetry is dynamical KMS. Good. Yeah, let me just, uh, 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 I'm running out of time, let me just, Quickly, uh, 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 wrap up here, and again, this is yeah. Uh, uh, also, this formulation is very general. You can uh, now be generalized to other continuous media, as solid, liquid crystals, uh, quasi crystal, etc., and also can be uh, 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 to MHD, etc. Okay, uh, uh, you can generalize in various way. Yeah, anyway, yeah, so, uh, uh, so uh, uh, I'm already uh, uh, out of time, so let me just stop here. Um, yeah.